I'm Safi. And I'm Mystic. And this is Lore Together. This is the podcast where a married couple talks about all the world building characters and lore of video games because it's the thing that we like to do together. We lore together. Yes, and it's episode 12, and we're changing things up this time. Oh my gosh. Basically, we're giving Mystic a break. <laughs> I needed one. I did 11 episodes of research. Yeah, and um, and we're still going to keep it that mostly Mystic will do it, yes. but when Mystic wants a break, this is actually a place for me to kind of shine, and I like talking about my favorite fantasy series, period, Dragon Age. It's... Oh, I'm so excited, guys. Now, well, first, before we get into Dragon Age itself, yeah. we should probably tell people where to contact us yes so if you want to follow us on twitter that's where i'm usually gallivanting about that's at lore together you can also email us directly lore together at gmail.com you'll see mystic bouncing about um on reddit with the username lore together pod yes and you can also if you like this series and you want to support us you can go to patreon and support us at patreon.com slash lore together where you can get early access to episodes access to our streams and hopefully coming soon patreon exclusive mini episodes yeah i've got some ideas i've actually got some ideas especially with this now because one of my ideas kind of fell through but this is something i could do on my own without having to get extra individuals in for research and stuff though i may go back to that idea yeah i have an idea for a missed mini episode I'm all for so, mini episodes. Yeah, that's we'll probably end up doing a lot. They're of not going to be deep dives. I think it's going to be broad, very, very. It's going to be when I should say deep dives. I'm thinking the mini episodes are going to be touching on you know if we do Elder Scrolls, it'll be like here's the history of this one town. If yeah. we do, or or little incidents that happens or something like right. that, like a little mission that everybody like is a fan favorite. You right. know. For example, you know, Dragon Age fans for Intercision will know about Lord Wolseley. That's not something you do a whole episode on. But it could be a mini episode. I would love to talk about it a little bit more. Yeah. So, but so we'll, we'll, yeah. Do, we'll do little ones of those. I think eventually they will come out. Yeah, but it'll probably be either weeks or months. Yeah. I'm thinking. So, um, so with. I should say come out publicly. Publicly, yeah. yeah. So, again, that's uh, uh, patreon.com slash lore together if you want to sign up and. and preemptively be ready for when we're doing our little mini episodes yeah and if you guys are listening on any service that allows ratings please give us a rating we appreciate it it helps people find us and yeah. uh, it'll help us in the long run like thank you to Aramithius, who we've given a shout out to before who does the written and uncertainty podcast as well as some mm-hmm. others uh he gave us a review and it was very kind and Aramithius, we heart you thank you very much and check out written and uncertainty yes absolutely i think there needs to be more lore podcasts in general when it comes to video games there's a lot of news ones which are great and you, is, you can find a personality but deep diving like you and i do is just not as prevalent <laughs> there's not as many people who are willing to do the time right or if they do it's a it's one series only yeah so the water's fine i don't know yeah jump in it's all yeah. fun speaking of diving deep dragon age yeah so dragon age is the fantasy series that is developed by one of our favorite publishers, Bioware. I say... Developer. Developer. Not publisher. I'm sorry. EA is the publisher, right? I don't remember if Microsoft was the original publisher. Because mm-hmm. for a while, their Microsoft was publishing Bioware stuff. I think they published yes. Mass Effect 1 originally. And yes. then EA bought Bioware. Yes. I don't remember where Dragon Age falls in that timeline, but it is now published by EA. Yes. So, which, I mean, if you can have whatever personal thoughts you want on electronic arts, we're not here to debate that. We're not big fans of big publishers, generally Generally, speaking, but they're the IP key holders. Yes. So, So, and we do love a lot of what Bioware does, as long as there's not as much interference. I mean, there's Mm -hmm. been some issues recently. We won't get into that. There's plenty of people complaining about that. What we're going to be talking about today is not even a specific game. So. Oh. No. It's not a specific game. I don't know a lot of what Safi's going to be talking about other than it's Dragon Age and it's story related. It is very story related. And it is very much kind of like what you've done recently with the Myst series where you've you've been digging into uh, material that is not in the games. 
I did this. I dug into multiple sources of material that are not in the games. I wanted to focus on a piece of lore whose impact isn't as obvious for Dragon Age. And we should probably just preface and say, for those of you who might not know what Dragon Age is, it is the series and the setting for the fantasy game that's been developed by Bioware since, what is that? Um, must have been since t- 2008. It's, it, it was released, what, 2009, 2010? It was released right around the time that you and I started dating. <laughs> That's I how I remember I that. I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember when it I, came out exactly. So it's I, been about a decade, though, I'd it's say. It's been over a decade. And the reason I remember this is, so we first started dating. We had played Mass Effect together where you were playing it on the Xbox and I was making the decisions. And then Dragon Age came out and you wanted me to try it but I had to borrow your laptop. And because we were such hyper... Oh, that was a terrible laptop, too. It was a terrible laptop, but I just... (laughs) But I wanted to play it, and you needed it for the work stuff you were doing at the time. And we were both hyper cautious because we'd be coming out of bad relationships before we met each other. Oh, yeah, I made you sign a contract. Yeah, you made me sign a contract about our laptop. And both of us were like, this is fine. This is... You know, some people will be like, well, love should be okay. No, 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 no. It, I think it was because no, we had only I've known that, each other for like a year at that point. I've thought, I, I thought love was okay once, and then somebody took a $500 computer. So. Right, <laughs> right. So we had learned, and I mean, I'd been through some stuff too, and also People's Court's one of my favorite shows. So so when, when he <laughs> Small said- Small claims. Yeah. So when, was, when he said, let's sign a contract for it, I thought it was perfectly fair and reasonable because he's the one who bought the laptop. So I took it home and I finished the first Dragon Age game, Dragon Age Origins. Um, and now, I was captivated by it. It's, it's been a long, long, long time since i played dragon age origins and in fact i kind of want to go back and play it now just thinking about the origins part of dragon age origins yeah where you got to pick different starting points for your character i have to say as much as mass effect kind of in their advertising when the series first came out was focused on the decision making that you do as a player dragon age is better at being being much more versatile with it and and pull and you know dealing with the punches of well what do we do if there's different variants of different choices they they did it very well that's true um yeah and the, yeah and the whole point of the series to be honest was to be more of a grim dark kind of fantasy literally a dark fantasy story so instead of what we consider high fantasy, which is very much in the Legend of Tolkien, there's kind of the dark fantasy is a bit, it's gory, it's bloody, it's human, and including the bad parts of being human. You literally start out the series talking about these people called the Grey Wardens, and they're not worried about the, you know, teen or older rating while people are slashing heads off and blood's gushing out in the animations, which... Even for when it came out around 2008, 2009, it was it had taken so long for them to develop the game that the graphics weren't necessarily that good. But the yeah, storytelling been in, was. I, I know that had been in development for a long time. Uh, like five, six years. I think it had been in development longer than they even were thinking about Mass Effect for whatever is that, reason. Is that the one that they... Was it one or two? I don't think it was three. Was it one or two that they advertised with Marilyn Manson? One. Okay. It was one. I just remember that. I just remember that was a really good... So that was a really good trailer, but then I just remembered they also did 30 Seconds to Mars Yes. for the credits, correct? Yes, I think they did at the end, which I know you were excited about at the time. So At, at the time. At the time. <laughs> we're just going to say at the time. Since then, there's been like three games in the series. There's also been, you know, was it six or seven books that have been published? We have World of Thetis um, 1 and 2, which are basically encyclopedias of the worlds themselves. I own both of them. And I've just fallen in love with this world. I'm a sci-fi fan, but for some reason, I think because Dragon Age had a very unique take on certain fantasy tropes, I just found myself compelled and pulled into it and just really embraced the kind of dark fantasy setting that they really wanted to get from the get go and have kept throughout the series, you know, sometimes much more successfully than others. <laughs> so can, uh, there's one thing you, you, uh, you've mentioned the book of Thetis mm-hmm. and stuff. And it's like the, one of the things I do know of the lore that's not lore. Yeah. Is the name Thetis. Oh, we'll talk about that. I've put it in. You I've, do have it. Okay. Yes. I have it in there briefly. 
So, so, so what are we digging into if we're not digging into the game? Well, I wanted to focus on a piece of lore whose impact isn't as obvious for Dragon Age the over the whole. I very much love the world building that was revealed in some of the most recent DLCs for Dragon Age Inquisition, the latest game, which includes Trespasser and Descent. In fact, I have run a high-level one-shot tabletop RPG to reflect a theory I developed based on those specific DLCs which at this point, a shout out to Green Ronin Publishing, who made some great rules for the Dragon Age RPG. And in fact, that's one of the things I want to talk about is a mini episode is just pledging my allegiance to how awesome not only that game is, but also being able to meet some of the writers of that. I should point out at this moment, I'm looking at Safi across the room from me yeah. as we're recording. And she's talking about Green Ronin as she has oh, yeah. on her Modern Age Game Master t-shirt <laughs> that she got at at Gen Con last year. Yeah, so I've I've run stuff for Green Ronin at Gen Con. I might do virtual Gen Con this year. I don't know. I haven't signed up for my virtual badge just because being pregnant, it's kind of like I I'm kind of loosey goosey with it right now. Right. But yeah, I think we might do a mini sode about either the game I wrote or how awesome the Dragon Age RPG is and the age yeah. system it uses because Green Ronin did a really good job with that. And, and that's a lot of the kind of lore, what I'm talking about in Trespasser and the Descent, as well as some of the, in the things it touches upon, which is the elven lore, the dwarven lore, the ancient lore of the world building. Mm -hmm. That's what a lot of people like dig into. Not only those mythos, but as well as like the mystery of the origins of the Canari. Okay, I'll get into what the Canari are later, because we will talk about them a little bit. <laughs> but those <laughs> I, are the juicy, interesting things. I barely know anything about the Canari, other than the little bits that you hear from the Iron Bull. Right. And the fact... Or... Or Sten. Yes, from but the first game. they changed the look. Yes. They changed so much of the Canary between that and the later games. For Star Trek fans, they essentially pulled a Klingon. Yes. Yeah. They essentially did that. But Sten still looks like how he did in the original game, and there's a whole... There's a whole mythos Wait, now. you see him again? Yeah. When? I'm not saying anything. My, Just, my question is, is he in a game and I missed him or is no. he in a... Okay, so I, so I didn't miss him in a cutscene somewhere. No. Okay, that's what I was concerned about. No, 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 no. We're going to talk... We'll talk about this. We'll talk about this. There's going to be a lot of stuff <laughs> that I think like... I think Mystic's going to be like, what? <laughs> like, okay, so I, I've played all three Dragon Age games. You have, yes. And I played the first one a f quite a few times. The second we one I played... We both did. We yeah. played that one a lot. The second one I played a lot less than you did. I did, a, I did two full playthroughs and then one... One playthrough I should have finished, yeah. Yeah, I only did the one. I started a second, and that was it. Mm -hmm. The third one I played a chunk of, like, maybe 12 times. I've done... Because that was such a... You could just go through that really rapidly if you wanted to. If you wanted to, yeah. I have I don't, I but so I've only... I've probably played half the hours you have, but also that was around the same time when Inquisition came out. That was when you were basically... Your gift to me for, like, Christmas and birthdays and stuff were World of Thetis encyclopedias, the fiction books to read, yeah. even like, oh, they don't have a color. You didn't get me the coloring book yet. You got me the Mass Effect coloring book. But there was a lot of stuff that you got from me that was Dragon Age related. So I was able to indulge in the world without going into Inquisition because Inquisition is basically this wide puddle of lore. There's all these right. little tidbits you can get. And it's not even until you get the Trespasser and the Descent DLC or even like Jaws of Hakan where you get like a little bit more to sink your teeth into right. and really start, especially if you like making theories like I do. And I have been on the Reddit, the subreddits for Dragon Age lore, like talking about lore because I just find it, I find it fascinating. What about the lore of finding shards? Yeah, I'm pissed off about that one. <laughs> but it's that's just, what, that's it's just one of the biggest missteps. You know in what? That game. Maybe that should be a mini episode of like, you know, basically going off on the things that we don't like in games. That we've played yeah. and love, but anyway. Anyway, so so what do we? So okay, so I've I've digressed us. I'm sorry. It, that's I do that to you all the time. What what are we, what are we actually discussing so, today? Yeah, because the stuff about like the mythos and the history of like the different races that you encounter, the elves, the dwarves, the Canari, they were juicy, interesting, but that seemed too obvious and honestly too big a series. We could spend months covering those mysteries and end up with another four-part series like we did with Elder Scrolls, and I wasn't ready to do that. <laughs> and I think Mystic does a great job, so I didn't want to switch roles for that long. So Right. Thank you. That's fair. Instead, I want to focus on something we forget affects the entire series from the beginning, but is in a lot of ways forgotten. 
This is the life of Merrick Theron. Which, P.S., if I mispronounce certain names, my apologies. A lot of these I know through reading and not through the games. And even when I've rewatched some of the cutscenes or replayed it, I don't always hear it right. So if, if anybody wishes to correct me on Twitter, at Lore Together, it's perfectly fine. So it's going to be like Katrine and Catherine, which one's the correct pronunciation? Right, exactly. <laughs> so, But we're going to talk about the life of Merrick Theron, father to King Kalen, who we meet early in the Dragon Age Origins game. Ah, and who... Just... Yeah. yeah. Well, you'll have time to chime in on that. Also a close friend to Logan McTeer, who is one of the main antagonists of the same game. And before all of that, the liberator of Ferelden from War Legion occupation. I was gonna say, like, that's kind of all I know is that he was father to King Kalen, mm-hmm. and he fought in the war with Orle. Yes. So before that's we kind of about all I know. Well, so before we speak about Merrick, we should speak about the politics of Orle and Ferelden. Both countries are part of Thetis, which is the name of the continent that all the Dragon Age games take place on. Which, as you were alluding to earlier, Mystic, is an acronym for. The Dragon Age system. The Dragon Age setting. The Dragon Age... Well, oh, the dra- I've read Dragon Age system. Really? Yeah. I want, I've heard setting. I wonder where the discrepancy comes from. Either way... It's interchangeable. It's... Yeah. Thetis is the D-A-S Thetis. Yeah. But it works perfectly. Yeah, it worked. It, yeah. I don't think it was their, int- or their original intent, but it works. Right. A lot of good ideas are like that. So... It is acknowledged that this is not the only continent, noting that there has to be a northern continent that the Canari which is the catch-all term for the horned, broad, dark race of humanoids that practice the philosophical Kuhn teachings. We call them Kunari, but that's technically, actually anybody who follows the Kuhn is a Kunari, but most of the followers that you meet of the Kuhn happen to be these tall, broad, swarthy, horned race of people. So, Hmm. I, it's... I'm already learning stuff, so this is good. (laughs) Yeah. That's actually in Dragon Age Inquisition, well, the Iron Bull says, oh, this is my fellow Kunari, and it's an elf. Yeah, I I, I remember that. I didn't know that he was, I didn't catch that line or that reference. I know who you're talking about. uh, I forgot his name off the top of my head. Yeah. Well, and I forget, his name is also his title, like it always is for the Kunari, because your name shows what your purpose is in the, when you follow the Kunari. Now, the Iron Bull is obviously... He takes on a nickname because of... It's easier. He's essentially of the spy. He's like one of the spy network of the Kunari. Of... Um... Talvashoth, right? No. No, Talvashoth, I thought, was somebody who's separated from it. I could be well, wrong. Well, no, no, I think you're right, actually. Ben Hasrath. Talvashoth. Yes, yes, he's Ben Hasrath. Yeah. yeah. Talvashoth is what he I wants I remembered... <laughs> That's what he wants to present to be, but he tells the Inquisitor, I'm actually Ben Hasaroth. So, anyway. So, we know that the where the Kuhn originated, which was where the where we, we consider the Canari are from, is north of Thetis. We don't know where that world is, and in fact, the Canari we meet don't know where that world is either. We where, are, hmm? um, so, I'm, I'm going to unfortunately digress, because I'm trying to col- uh, like collect my the lords in my head and yeah. trying to make sense. Where's Parvalin then? In Sahoran, which is a north of the Free Marches and Kirkwall and all that, if okay. I remember correctly. So north of there, still even. Yeah, I I wasn't gonna go too much into the map. But, but I just want I just want to say like, Dragon Age One takes place in Ferelden. Yeah, that's what we were gonna talk about. That okay. yeah. That's only one part of a large continent. Yes. And so they're from even further away than the north part of that continent far away in another continent yeah and we don't necessarily okay. know where that is and then there's stuff even to the south of thetis actually really yes there's reference that past the kakari wilds in the south is the sunless lands that the Dogians, natives of thetis know little about there's also places in the west that we don't know about and then there's supposed to be places that are across the sea that we hear references to wild crazy like violent elves according to legends essentially what the writers and the world builders of Thetis did is they made a very good solid continent that we can sink our teeth into for probably the rest of the series, but also have given us enough that we can go off of Thetis, you know, sometime in the future. This is starting to sound like the Elder Scrolls 
when we covered it in um, Tamriel Nern and the Creation, when we talked yeah. about Akavir and all the other continents on Tamriel. But it's, it's yeah, it's kind of like with Tamriel, we know the whole... On uh, Nern. On uh, Nern. Sorry. Yeah. With Tamriel, <laughs> we know the whole even landmass. I wouldn't even say you know that with Thetis. So, so you know like... Okay. Yeah. So it's a little different. Our focus is mostly going to be on Ferelden, which is one of the two most influential nations on the continent of Thetis, the other being Orle, the empire that's next to it. Really? Ferelden is that powerful? It's important. Okay. I would say it's important. And in fact, it is important because people have decided it's important in history, I would say. Ferelden is where the first Dragon Age game occurs. The name Ferelden means Fertile Valley in the native tongue of the Alamari, the natives who originally occupied the land in tribal groupings. Now, in... The history of Dragon Age, we don't know where humans are from, but Ferelden was mostly populated with humans that were tri in tribal systems when human occupation first happened there. It's a Dragon Age Inquisition that it suggested that elves had taken head of the whole world first and then out of nowhere, humans happened. And in fact, it's actually in all three games it suggested that, you know, elves were the people. To be elven is means of the people. That suddenly, and dwarves were around too, and then suddenly out of nowhere humans came, and it changed the whole dynamic because humans just changed the whole ecology and politics of everything. Which, you know, mm -hmm. I was gonna say that that's almost it sounds almost like that fan theory for Elder Scrolls again, where the elves were the original people who mm -hmm. with the original magic and everything, and now they're trying to get back to that. <laughs> right. Yeah. And there's so. you know. There's illusions to that. But anyway, anyway. I'll stop comparing to Elder Scrolls. There's a, I think there's a lot. It's going to happen. Yeah. It's going to happen because Elder Scrolls is the older series and they both are still variants of the Tolkien-esque kind of fantasy setting. That's Elves just how it is. and yeah. dwarves and... <laughs> yeah. Although I, I like Thetis' dwarves better because they're still around. I like them. I I like Thetis's elves better because their history is really complicated. But that's going to be another show, another day. So I think the ones in Elder Scrolls are complicated too. It's just yeah, fair. It's anyway. different. It's different. It's different. So Ferelden means Fertile Valley in the native tongue of the Alamari, and they had lived in tribes in Ferelden that would not only fight themselves but bordering nations wishing to expand into Ferelden. This included Orle, an empire whose origin story includes killing and betraying Alamari chieftains centuries before Ferelden finally became an independent kingdom. What's important to recognize is that four centuries before the start of Dragon Age Origins, which they have their own way of keeping time, but for the sake of people who may not know about how they keep time, I'm going to just say how many centuries and years things are apart. And maybe that could be another episode is just talking about timelines, you know, another day. Yeah. yeah. I just want a slight correction. To my head, mm -hmm. all of the games take place within the same century, though, still, don't they? They take place within a decade of each other. That's a very busy decade. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's a busy century, and a century's not even halfway over by the time Inquisition's done. This seems to be a problem with a lot of games. Yeah. <laughs> But there's a reason for it. I mean, but right. there's always a reason for it. So anyway, so four centuries before the start of Dragon Age or Origins, a leader emerged to unite the disparate Arlings and Terrans that the tribes had established across Ferelden. That leader was King Kalanhad. What a name, right? Kalanhad? Kalanhad. Ka okay. All right. I think I see a connection for the future. <laughs> the story of Kalanhad is one of honor, victory, and righteous combat, at least at first. Then, after he unified Ferelden under his reign with the support of nobility, there's some magic, seduction, and potential civil war because Kalanhad couldn't keep it in his pants thanks to a love potion. Regardless, he secured his bloodline as the ruling family which continued through the centuries and survived even through what was called the Second Orlesian Invasion. Over a hundred years before we even get to the beginning of Dragon Age Origins, Orle begins to invade Ferelden, successfully slaying the ruling king Vanadrin Theron. Vanadrin. That's also a name. Yeah. They they have names in the ruling class of Ferelden. His successor, King Brandel, is unable to unite the nobles to fight the invaders. I think it's because he was young and he wasn't trained to be a leader, so he just did not have the same skill set that Vanadrin did. Mm -hmm. And in 20 years, Ferelden is under complete Orlesian occupation. 
This occupation would last 58 years, and rebels would continue to fight the occupying forces. Brandel is able to have a daughter, the rebel queen Moira, who has a son, who is the subject of the episode King Merrick. I know it's a lot to keep up with. That is a lot of names you just tossed at me. Okay. okay. So we're basically telling who begot who and who led to who. And now we're finally at King Merrick. Right. The important thing to note is one, King Callanhad's bloodline has been established and has been the ruling family for now four centuries, even during his occupation. And then has continued through King Merrick. That's pretty much the biggest part of that. Okay. There's not a lot about Merrick's childhood, but we have to assume it was fraught with hiding and eventually fighting the occupiers of his homeland, especially since he's born 34 years into the Orlesian occupation of Ferelden. This is my speculation, but I would believe that a person raised in a country under siege that is expected to reclaim it while dodging assassins and battles since birth would experience at least some sort of childhood trauma. However, we don't have a lot of references to it. Instead, we meet Merrick at one of the worst days of his life in the first book published for the Dragon Age universe, titled Dragon Age The Stolen Throne. Written by David Gator, the book literally starts with Merrick's dying mother commanding him to run. He ends up losing his usual traveling battle companions and running into the son of a rebel leader, Loghain MacTeer. Now, I mentioned earlier that Loghain is one of the antagonists in the first game of Origins. You're going to find that Merrick meets a lot of game antagonists, and I think his meeting of Loghain shapes the beginning of the video game series the most. Both are meeting as young men who are suffering the traumas of the occupation. While Merrick has lost his mother due to assassination, Loghain lost his mother because witnessing her torture and murder was a punishment for his father, quote-unquote, evading taxes to be paid to the occupying power. Okay, that explains a few things. <laughs> Fans of the series usually hate Loghain. It's not that there aren't people who don't like Loghain, but... And, and we'll get into it. My, there are a lot of people who hate Loghain, especially if you only play the games. My impression of Loghain, even in the game itself, because I haven't really gone beyond the games, really, but my impression of Loghain was somebody who was doing the wrong thing for the right reason. Broadly speaking. I'm going to... I'll color that later on, because I'm going to color that for you later on, because I, I think he's doing the... I think he's doing the wrong things for the wrong reasons, but with understandable motivations because of his past okay this is i think one of the biggest i should say i should say that to me uh, I, I should say that his actions seem to make sense given what he did what he lived through yeah and this is one of the worst things he lived through he is a teenager when this happens and oh. <laughs> <laughs> so not even like gen i was four <laughs> <laughs> right. No. Logan knew what happy farm life was, and his dad decided he, he was going to try to stick it to the invaders, and his mother is the one who paid the price. So, Can I say one thing I do like about this podcast is that we go is we reference all of our old episodes pretty frequently. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for Elder Scrolls, that's episodes two, uh, three through seven. For uh, All the Mist, it's one, two, ten, and eleven. Yeah. It's like, yeah, there's... <laughs> Now the competition is going to be, can we reference every single one in this episode? We'll if you see. manage to pull a Scars or Acadia reference outside of this, I'll be impressed. Um. Well, I mean, we're already talking about Loghain is the son of a rebel leader. <laughs> so, I mean... Wait, would we say leader? He just refused to pay taxes, or is there more to it than Losing that? his family after that, Loghain's father became a leader of rebels near the outskirts of the Kokari Wilds. That's literally the next sentence I wrote. Okay. Yeah. You do that to me all the time, too, so. Yeah. No, I'm not even mad. So, I feel like these experiences in Logan's formative years may explain the extreme action he takes in Origins that he thinks are protecting Ferelden, as mm -hmm. you kind of are already alluding to, so. Okay. Merrick waits before revealing his lineage to Loghain, and then, when being pursued by potential assassins to him, the two run into the Kukari Wilds. They're captured by a group of Dalish elves, which I'll quickly explain for the uninitiated. Elves come in two, na two main types in the world Ooh, of Thetis. Troublesome word. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. There's two main distinctions. That's not to say that they're... I will say this. The it's a cultural thing, right? Dragon Age... World building is very good at not making monocultures. True. So, 
But the two main types that are referenced within human culture are, are these two. There are the ones who live in the cities, an underclass of human society living in alienages stricken by poverty. And then the other are the Dalish, which are nomadic clans that do their best to hold on to their lost culture and traditions of their people. So Merrick and Loghain being captured by the latter type of elves, which don't even speak to them in the common trade tongue. They, they, they just kind of capture Merrick and Loghain and then take them to the Witch of the Wilds. Oh. Fans of the series will recognize this Re- as another antagonistic force. Right. Also, I want to reference the point that you said that Dragon Age has really good, does really good job of avoiding monocultures. Yeah. How come Mass Effect has terrible use of monocultures then? Different writers, <laughs> entirely different writers, entirely different writers. These, I, I feel like the people who wrote Dragon Age, especially because we follow them on Twitter and I've been reading them more often since I've been playing around with our Twitter, they are really good at listening at different cultures outside of their own and, and pulling what the variance of experience can be with that. Broadly speaking, I just want to say, I think Dragon Age has the better cultural breakdowns. I do... And is more inclusive Yes. overall. But I think Mass Effect has a little... Not much, diff, not much better, but a little bit better character to it. Hmm. I know so much now that I can't compare. That's I fair. haven't read the Mass Effect books, but I, what I can say... I'm not even talking... I'm talking just the games. I... I mm. But then again, the difference is the games you play... You have the same... A lot of the same characters in three games as opposed to Dragon Age where there's a lot of differentiation between yeah, them. Yeah, exactly. So that's... I, I, I withdraw my comment because that's an unfair comparison yeah. to make given that... That's like comparing so. apples to sledgehammers. It's just not... It's not going to work. Both are tasty. Mm, I'm, not, I'm not addressing that. So <laughs> so before we went on this, this tangent, Loghain and Merrick are captured and brought to the Witch of the Wilds. Fans of the series will recognize this as another antagonistic force of not even the first game, but a force throughout the entire series. By the time you meet her in Origins, she's going by the name Flemeth. Okay, she does change her name. She has many names. Well, I knew I figured I think she introduces herself by quite a few of them at some point. We meet her as Flemeth, I think mostly in Origins before she admits she's the Witch of the Wilds. In this, she is specifically called the Witch of the Wilds and she says to them, though the Dalish who brought you call me Asha Belinar, which is then referenced in Dragon Age 2. So, right. Mm-hmm. Flemeth is played amazingly well by Kate Mulgrew as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the voice acting in this game is great. Anyway, so Merrick and Logan are desperate to get out of the wilds. And in order to do so, Merrick is forced to make a deal with Flemeth. After reassuring Merrick that he is valuable and taunting Logan with the memories of his mother's demise. Sounds like Flemeth. She warns Merrick of Logan. Quote, keep him close and he will betray you each time worse than the last. End quote. The deal that Flemeth makes with Merrick is a promise made in secret, takes hours to secure in the night while Loghain waits outside her hut, and is never revealed in the rest of the book. With the help... Oh. Yeah. Okay. Just just doesn't come up at all. A promise made in secret that takes hours. Yeah. And of course, the really suspicious part is that like Merrick then makes the promise. He, goes, he tries to get some sleep before the morning comes. And, like, it's as if the hut had never been lived in and everything is gone. So, very shady. Very shady. Uh, With the help of a bluebird, they leave the wilds in four wait, days' time. What? <laughs> so, like, they wake up and this bluebird just is like, tweet, tweet. And they're like, and Merrick's like, oh, that's probably our way out. And Logan's like, are you daft? And Merrick's like, yeah, but come on, let's follow this bluebird. Because <laughs> that's Merrick's humor. And, like, they, they literally, within four days' time... They get out of the Kakari Wilds, not only like avoiding more Dalish, but avoiding wolves and avoiding other issues that would have arisen had they just tried to go out on their own. The Kakari Wilds are wilds for a reason. Mm-hmm. There's also human nomadic tribes like the Chastened that live there, and they've just avoid all of that thanks to this bluebird. Now, these these are the same wilds that are in Origins, correct? Yeah, it's the, the same they, Kakari they, Wilds, yeah. They're not like, are they further... 
south in them? Are they in the same area that we... Because we do meet Flemeth in Origins. I'm just trying to get... If, is it the same area roughly? I forget the map, but they definitely... Um, they definitely are... They get lost somewhere n- probably near the same area that you end up meeting Flemeth and then... Which is near... Yeah. Ostagar, right? Well, you get carried away from Ostagar in Origins. Oh, do you? If you... For, uh, Jeff, I forget. Yeah, if you forget, we could go over that because we're going to bring up origins a lot in this episode because oh, okay. that's where a lot of Merrick's influence starts. Um, so after four days, Merrick is reunited with his allies, which includes the woman he's betrothed to, Rowan Guerin. Fans put a pin in that last name. You may know where that last name Yeah, I'm, I've goes. heard that name. I don't remember where, but I've heard that. It will come back up again. The Stolen Throne goes through a lot of Merrick's continued adventures and unexpected allies throughout the remaining years of the Orlesian occupation. During this time, he ends up falling in love with an elf woman named Catriel. Unfortunately, she's a spy for the occupying forces. Oh, fun. However, throughout the story, it's almost embarrassing how infatuated he is with her, admitting at one point that this love is based on how Catriel sees him as a man and a prince, rather than how Rowan sees him. The boy she grew up with. As much as he knows he has duty and bond with Rowan, which he did, they at least have a really good friendship when you first meet them. Okay, now I'm now I'm curious who Guerin is. Then that I know that name. Just keep, just put a pin in that. Just keep it. Just keep it, because it'll come up later. I will bring it up. Don't don't worry. As much as he knows he has a duty and bond with Rowan, he blindly falls in love with Catriel. In fact, he's even having fantasies that Ferelden's going to let him marry this elf woman as his queen at some point. Which, no. if you know the politics of the human society in Thetis, that's just never going to happen. No, no, no. When Merrick, Loghain, Rowan, and Catriel find themselves down in the abandoned dwarven deep roads, which connects to the Orton Taig down there as well, Merrick confesses to Rowan his, that he has feelings for Catriel, and who by this time, Rowan and Loghain are extremely suspicious of, particularly because of her knowledge of the Deep Roads themselves while claiming to be just a quote-unquote mere messenger when she first joined the rebel forces. At the time, Merrick keeps his affections for Catriel through the trip, while Rowan and Loghain finally realize their own love for each other. I like to call this part of the book, We're Young and Horny in an Ancient Ruin in the Middle of a Civil War, what do we have left to lose? <laughs> also, Loghain portraying Merrick time one, for those of you keeping count, which it's a very mild betrayal, let's be honest. It's two almost 20-something guys, basically, like, you know, one's going for the woman he shouldn't go for, so the other one's going for the woman he should have gone for, if that makes sense. Mm. And, and Loghain and Rowan actually have a really good respect for each other, and that's why they fall in love. Whereas Merrick's just being dumb and... Catriel's also kind of being dumb, at least in my opinion. When I was reading it, that was the impression I got of that story. Is she being dumb? Like, okay. Well, I will extrapolate a little bit more. In the end, Merrick does find out that Catriel was a spy, thanks to Loghain supplying some evidence. He admits, quote, I have been a fool. Catriel tries to reassure him of her true feelings, but as she pleads, Merrick responds by running Catriel through with his blade in a blind rage. Wow. Okay. Wow. Yeah, he's mad. <laughs> that okay? What Logan keeps <laughs> from? Yeah, yeah. It's it's it was sad <laughs> to read that. What Logan keeps from Merrick, who finds out later this information was deliberately withheld, was that Catriel had cut her ties to her spy agreement after truly falling in love with Merrick. Merrick ends up regretting having so blindly killed Catriel without giving her a chance to defend herself. I was gonna say this sounds like it's. It, ra- rage doesn't lead to much good, usually. No. Uh, and yes, this is Loghain betraying Merrick the second time in my book. Like, I, I personally think this is twice now that Loghain has kind of not done what's best for Merrick. Well, at this point. it always struck me, in the game at least, that Loghain was quite racist. Oh, God. Blindly so. In, and, a, lot of different, in a lot of different ways. Right. And it's... Honestly, it makes more sense there than in typical human politics Uh, because at least they're different races well yeah i will say this though elves belong to the country they're born in and the only time that doesn't really count is the dalish who are nomadic 
precisely because that's the only way they can hold on to their traditions. They share stories with each other. They do research. They actually have a once a decade summit where they share every all their knowledge with each other. Do they? Yeah, the Dalish do. I'm, they, if they've mentioned that in the games, I might have missed it. No, that. that's in the that's in I think in World of Day this volume two i don't think that's in volume one but yeah those are the only ones that don't really have a country that they call home whereas most other elves are part of a nation so is there an elven nation no so they're only basically human nations it's it's kind of like i hate making um comparisons to this because the way it's written it's definitely not supposed to be a parallel but there are a lot of similarities with aboriginal cultures that have been taken over by western imperialists when it comes to humans taking over thetis regardless of the nation so and that's why you have either usually poverty stricken elves in the cities and towns or sometimes enslaved in certain other countries and the other main faction of elves tends to be the dalish who are typically nomadic more independent. More independent. You know, depending on the... Ma- Fiercely independent, actually. Yeah. Depending on the group, some of them are fine with dealing with human civilization. Other ones remove themselves very far away from human civilization because of the bitterness. They feel like that that's who took their culture away. I just know that they have a... The racial epithets in... Oh, man. Dragon Age are something else. Mm-hmm. Because well, the common one I hear all the time for elves is knife ears, which is... Oof. That's just bad. But then I also hear Shemlin for for human. Which translates to a, the quick ones. Because they feel like... So in elven culture in Dragon Age, they used to be immortal. And when humans came, they lost that ability. Oh, that also sounds like Elder Scrolls. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, again, there's going to be a lot of parallels. Why, why are they... Uh, why, first off, why are elves always immortal? Well, they're not anymore. Well, but like, why do they always start there? Why do we start with that as the as the pretext? I mean, this is going to be another episode someday, probably. And I don't even know if it'll be my next episode the next time you need a break. But with the elven history, it's really complicated because those are stories that are passed down. But they're so old, we don't know if they're true. And when you get to Trespasser in the DLC for Dragon Age Inquisition... It's pretty much suggested that a good chunk of what you thought you knew is completely different. That's, yeah. So, and and that's all I'll say about that because Trespasser should be played and enjoyed on its own. If you're somebody who's into the deep lore, finish Inquisition, get to Trespasser, it's great. Now, I do have a question. Was Trespasser a retcon or an extrapolation? Extrapolation. Okay. Yeah. And which is easy to do when you're talking about centuries old stories that nobody's really confirmed. Because that's a very fine line between whether it's a retcon or extrapolation to some people. Yeah. Getting back to Merrick. Right. The Stolen Throne does end with Merrick leading the rebellion to success, overthrowing the Elysian occupiers with possibly some help from a mysterious dragon on the Elysian countryside. And that's a dragon out of nowhere. Yeah. Literally, they thought they were extinct and suddenly like, woo, dragon. So after victory, Merrick marries Rowan in an epilogue where the story is being told to Prince Kalen. Okay. Outside of this retelling of the story to Kalen, it is confirmed that the whole Logan merrick rowan dynamic is now weird, and essentially Rowan finds excuses to never accompany Merrick when he visits the Terran of Gwerin that was awarded to Logan after the war. So Rowan and Logan essentially avoid each other for the rest of their lives. And literally it's said in the book... That if Logan's name came up, Rowan looks really sad, and suddenly Merrick looks really sad, and then it gets really quiet and awkward. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, wait a minute. So, Guerin is her last name. No. So. Am I misremembering something here? So, or did I misunderstand something here? G- Guerin is her. I think I might have been pronouncing it like Guerin, but Guerin is her last name. So, Rowan's last name is G U E. R-R-I-N, okay, I was hearing the same because you said, "Where?" Yeah, I might have said it the same. That's possible. Okay, that's annoying as heck. <laughs> yeah, but they're two different names. They're two different names. Okay, Guerin, where Logan is awarded as, and he, that's his turn. So that's Guerin as G- opposed to G W A R E Guerin. Guerin, which is yeah. Okay, and I might have said I might have put a W when I should have did the U, and I apologize. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
I just wanted to make sure because I was very confused for a second if that was the thing I had to keep opinion. No, no, no. That's exactly what you need to clear up for the audience. It's fine. Um, <laughs> it's also confirmed at this time that Rowan has passed away a few years after Kaylin's birth due to an unexpected illness that even mages could not cure. Is it is it mm. nefarious or is it just they don't know what's going Later on? Later on, it's theorized that she probably picked up some something in the deep roads. And oh, fun. Okay. Yeah. All right. But and they and it just took a while for it to get to her and take her life. Do they meet any darkspawn? Yes. Okay. They meet some darkspawn, they meet some dwarves, and dwarves actually help them a little bit with the rebellion before the dwarves are like, We need to get back underground or else we're gonna fall in the sky and then like <laughs> go back down. <downstairs. laughs> <laughs> like that's pretty much what happens. Okay, so I'm laughing partially because Safi ran a Dragon Age campaign. Yeah, speaking of tabletop RPGs. And I was playing a dwarf who was so afraid of falling into the sky that he would not walk out from underneath a roof without a giant rock. I'm just carrying this boulder. It was funny because we never got to finish that campaign, but I wish we could go back because we called it the Oddquisition. It was taking place during the Inquisition time. There were some weird characters, too. I mean, we were all, you guys were all playing just really weird I people. Was, I was a dwarf. We had a friend who was essentially a mage from one of the... Avar clans, right? Avar clans. He was the weird one. He was the talkative one. But he was also the weird one. <laughs> the most normal one was the De, De La Shelf archer. And then we I... had a very gaunt, canary, knifey knife person that was with us yes. for a while who didn't talk, was very quiet. And but acted it too. Like was sitting at the table acting all his facial expressions. It was great. It was it was fantastic. And it was short lived, but I still it still holds a place in my heart. Anyway, so even though Rowan, his queen, passes away uh-huh. and leaves him, you know, basically widowed with the child to raise, Merrick is still actually a popular king in Ferelden and he earns the title Merrick the Savior. Because he has released them from more Legion occupation. Right, right. However, with Rowan gone and stuck with five-year-old Kaylin the Rays, we next find Merrick in a bit of a funk at the beginning of The Calling, the next Dragon Age book, also written by David Gator. The story starts with Merrick being approached by Genevieve, commander of the Grey Wardens. Now, for those of you not in the know, and this might become even more of a tangent than our previous tangent, <laughs> Grey Wardens are literally the whole reason the first Dragon Age game exists. They are an order of people bound to stand guard and protect Thetis from a supernatural plague and conquest referred to as the Blight. Essentially, every once in a while in the course of history, a quote-unquote old god, which is really just an ancient dragon previously worshipped centuries ago by humans in the nation known as Tevinter. Tevinter is north of where Ferelden and Orle is. It just, again, drawing another parallel to Elder Scrolls where people used to worship dragons. Yeah. <laughs> At least Skyrim, I should say. An old god is awoken by tainted creatures called the Darkspawn. These Darkspawn then taint that god, transforming them into an archdemon that will lead an attack on the known world. The Blight is a combination of destructive conquest through battle and environmental blight, a plague that will kill all manner of people, and even supernatural transformation of living people into monsters, the most infamous being the Broodmothers who produce more Darkspawn. Oh. We are not going to get into Broodmothers. We are a family-friendly podcast. That was a rough battle. But there's other... That was a disgusting-looking battle. <laughs> yeah. There are other... And in fact, that's part of the reason why they think that Rowan got something from the Deep Roads is because they she might have accidentally caught just the faintest bit of darkspawn taint, and it took a while before it finally took her life. Mm. So, you know, okay, because she was essentially like wasting and withering away before she died. It was very supernatural, and the mages couldn't figure it out. So. Grey Wardens have been the only organization to ever successfully stop Blights by slaying the Archdemon outright. This typically grants Grey Wardens some respect. However, since the time between Blights can be centuries, which is true at the point of even this point of history as Merrick is still in his funk, the horrifying history of the Blights can be forgotten. And in the case of Ferelden, politics have left a lot of the feelings to the wards to be best described as prickly. 
Mm. Like they're not even really allowed to be in a Ferelden at this point. There's actually some DLC for Origins that explains how there was a Grey Warden that kind of helped or Legion occupying forces at some point. If I remember it correctly, I didn't dig into that for this episode. But yeah, they got one Grey Warden ruined it for the rest of the Grey Wardens and Ferelden's don't trust them. Hmm. This is a situation where Genevieve reaches out to King Merrick who, along with Loghain, are the only ones to have survived to tell the tale of the Tig and Dark Roads they traveled during the rebellion to reclaim Ferelden. Genevieve's brother, Bregan, has been captured by Darkspawn and taken down there. Now, typically, a death in the Deep Roads is an honorable way for the Grey Wardens to die, and in fact, many of them choose to end their lives this way. Right. However, Bregan actually has knowledge of where the remaining old gods are thought to be buried. And Genevieve fears this information will be tortured out of him to start the next blight. Why does he have this information? He is a, he, he apparently researched it. Then he actually, he did go to the Deep Roads being like, oh. Let me find an elder god? No, like, he was like, oh no, that's my it's my time to die, essentially. It's, and that's why the book is titled The Calling. Okay. Because the way Grey Wardens get their power is is essentially taking on just the faintest bit of the taint. But over time... It takes over your brain and you hear the song and it starts madness. And the most more rather than to just go mad and deteriorate, they just go into the deep roads, find some dark spawn and kill as many as they can until they're cut down. That's the way a gray warden is supposed to die. And that's when they call it the calling. OK, but she has a hunch that instead he got captured by something that's going to keep him alive. There's not many intelligent dark spawn, though, is there? Put a pin in that idea. <laughs> I have a vague idea where that's going, but yeah. OK. Wanting help from the two people who survived the path of the dark roads that she's going to have to take, Genevieve asks, well, it's mostly at this point, Loghain. He's already considered a hero at this point, and she figured she would ask Loghain to to accompany them and help guide them through it. Um, Loghain immediately refuses, and almost as quickly, Merrick accepts to Hmm. help. Later on, Loghain tries to talk Merrick out of it, reminding him of his son, Merrick at this point, though, is quite depressed. Rowan has passed away. The thrill of rebuilding the kingdom is gone. And the words of the Witch of the Wilds from his youth are instilling a lot of fear in him. She had said a blight was to come to Ferelden, and he would not live to see it. Right. Merrick doesn't want to see the country he just rescued torn asunder by this potential of invasion even after his death. And he's inclined to believe Flemeth because she had been true to her words in his eyes. Even at this point in the story, he does not believe Loghain has betrayed him, which as the audience, we may already know that, yes, Loghain has betrayed him in theory. So he doesn't suspect, he's he still is oblivious to the betrayals. I will say this. I don't think Merrick sees Loghain and Rowan having a fling, having their thing as a betrayal per se. Okay. And Logan did back off after basically Merrick said, help me rule Ferelden. And Logan realizes that means I need to stop having a relationship with Rowan. And it, it just, and that's part of the reason why they just don't talk really ever again. After Would the you, rebellion. you know, I was about to jump forward in the timeline. Let me not do that. So. That's okay. Yeah. We're going to, we're going here sequentially. So, but I would definitely say not telling him that Catriel changed her damn mind about how she feel, right. she felt about her contract is definitely a betrayal. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. After convincing Logan he won't join the Wardens on this quest, Merrick sneaks away and asks the Wardens to not even refer to him as king when he goes with them. Abdicating his throne? No, he doesn't abdicate his throne. Essentially, he gives Logan a note being like, ha ha, I left anyway. Please watch my son in my kingdom. He doesn't like leave. I don't even know if he leaves a note. He just kind of just decides that Logan will figure it out. In this group of Wardens are two characters that the fans of the series will recognize. Duncan? And Fiona. Fiona, Fiona, Fiona. Oh, Dragon Age Inquisition, Grand Enchantress, right? Right. Well, first about Duncan. We meet him actually in the beginning of Dragon Age Origins as the leader of the small group of wardens currently in Ferelden. In the game, he's presented as even-tempered and wise. But in The Calling, we're introduced to a young, impulsive Duncan who hooks up with random women and seems to be much more listless. Considering he was conscripted to the wardens before he could be executed in Orlais for having murdered a warden in a robbery gone wrong. Fiona, an elf mage originally from Orlais, is actually more of a figure in Inquisition like you just mentioned. In that game, 
you have to either try to rescue the mages or the Templars from the influence of the main bad guy, Corypheus, who in another episode in the future, I will get into how I think his motivations and stances are the most underutilized in a writing standpoint. <laughs> that may just be me. I, I do want to point out uh, just something that you mentioned. I don't know if you're going to mention the conscription that they do. Oh yeah. Grey Wardens have the right of conscription. So essentially if they decide that they need to conscript you to the fight of the blight, they get to do it regardless. And it's kind of this pact it's a very, that it's they It's a have. very powerful thing that they can do because like you just said, the guy was about to be executed and he's they're like, no, we're taking him. Right. And it's partly because so the blight that we fight in Dragon Age Origins is the fifth blight. So they're the reason that the world still is in order because they're the only reason why the first blight was ever defeated. Are the blights in living memory still? Like, do people still no. actually think about it? So no. they're, we're talking like ancient stories that people may not believe you. Literally centuries ago. Okay. Yeah, literally centuries ago. So that explains a few things too. Yeah, but in Inquisition, if you save the mages, their leader is Fiona, who was the Grand Enchanter before the mage rebellion mm -hmm. and she's a wise powerful mage that you get to speak to in the library in skyhold if you save the templars you end up having to fight her at the first act battle in haven but when we first meet fiona in the calling she's very cold to merrick and even avoids him entirely as much as she can merrick is actually very helpful in navigating the part of the abandoned dwarven taig and deep roads that he has traversed years ago surprised by his own recall the group has some battles in these areas that prove fatal and it turns out the wardens have been previously compromised this is where we can introduce another antagonist that merrick now has a history with called the architect ah mm -hmm. okay that's right that's what you said keep a pin in the intelligent darkspawn absolutely the Architect is from the DLC called Awakening. A story set two years after the events of Origins, the Architect is leading a group of sentient darkspawn that attempts to capture the Warden Commander of the Grey Wardens of Ferelden. The player character in the DLC, which is usually the player character from Origins, depending on how you, your end game choices played out at mm -hmm. that time. We'll talk more about how those choices can affect the story and even Merrick's influence later. In The Calling... The architect is pursuing a novel idea, peace amongst Darkspawn and all the other races. He's captured Bregan to convince him to help. He also has already recruited a mage ally on the top surface, the first enchanter of the circle that's in Kinlock Hold that's in Ferelden, which is a Orlesian named Ramil. Kinlock Hold? Yeah. Fans will remember the awful situation that the Wardens resolve in Origins in Kinlock Hold. Oh, is that Kinlock Hold? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And to me, it's a surprise that not even the mages have burnt the place down and moved elsewhere with all the bad mojo happening in a place where you have to train youths to not get possessed by demons. Regardless, the First Enchanter has given the Wardens trinkets that will bring them closer towards the Dark Spawn intentionally and sympathetic to them by essentially speeding up the calling mm -hmm. in their heads. The only reason that Duncan is immune to this is because he's a dirty thief who stole from the first enchanter a dagger that counters the curse on the compromising trinket. Like literally Duncan at this point, when he was recruited, he's obviously like a robber and a thief. Right. And, he's and a murderer. And a murderer. Yes. And he kind of idly just still steals stuff. So at the beginning of the story, they're Once actually... Once a thief, always a thief. <laughs> I mean, apparently. So he kind of actually... If I remember the beginning of the story correctly, they're kind of, you know, meeting up with the mages before they're going to meet up with Merrick and Loghain, or he's staying with these mages, and tr he's, like, really curious, and he's going around, and he finds this dagger, and he's like, this looks cool, I'm going to take it, and then he runs into this mage girl, and this mage girl, having been locked up in Kinlock Hold, sees this swarthy part Ravani guy just hanging out, and is like, ooh, dangerous, and they just end up hooking up, so... <laughs> Okay. <laughs> That's kind of so you know <laughs> he's a troublemaker at this point. Very different than the Duncan that we actually meet in Origins. Do you still have that beard? No, he doesn't have a beard <laughs> at this point. Now I don't want to go into the detail of the plot of the calling, which I think is a 
better than the Stolen Throne because it embraces the uniqueness of the Dragon Age setting in a way that the Stolen Throne probably just couldn't considering the subject matter. Right. The Stolen Throne sounds a lot more in the broad strokes just like typical European Eurocentric fantasy. Yes. Here's elves. Here's dwarves. Here's a little bit of flavor for the universe. Lineage and legacy. Right. And, and proper installment of the throne. Even though it's less politics. about... Politics. Yeah, it's less about destiny, a little bit more about politics, but it still has a lot of that same tenor. This is kind of embracing what makes Thetis a unique setting. Yeah, the dark okay. spawn and the blight and the Grey Wardens. Yeah. I would encourage even non-fans to read it because it's more compelling and talks about the dark spawn in an enlightening way way probably ways that i'll touch upon on this corypheus episode i now want to do sometime in the future there are a couple of huge merrick related events or really connections that happen in this book that i wish to highlight first one is that duncan and merrick become friends fighting darkspawn a dragon disloyal wardens and a power hungry mage together duncan reminds merrick of the times when merrick was young and fighting in the rebellion the impulsive nature duncan has combined with the guilt he carries through their journey mostly due to the deaths related to the Grey Wardens, reminds Merrick of the hard choices he's made. He shares with Duncan the story of his murder of Catriel, almost as a way to sympathize with the burden Duncan carries during their travels in the Deep Roads. This is really spurred on not only because it turns out the person that Duncan murdered before he was conscripted was the fiancé of Genevieve, the commander. Oh. Which, you know, they're... Okay. (laughs) And the reason she conscripted him was not because she saw his potential, but as later on, she admits that... Punishment? She was hoping he wasn't going to survive the ritual that makes you a great warden. Well, guess what? (laughs) Now she's stuck with him. And then Merrick is trying to make Duncan feel better. It's almost kind of like, to me, it felt a little like older brother, little brother kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, around the time that Merrick talks about Catriel is after they fight this dragon that's hiding in the deep roads and Duncan does this really outrageous move where he's climbing up on the dragon and he stabs it in the neck and he's getting thrown off of it and he's about to get in its maw and one of the other gray wardens named Julian like pulls him out from danger and ends up being the one that gets basically bit and shaked and thrown against the wall and dies (laughs) so and The, the, the climbing is he climbing with daggers? Yes, he's doing that so two-dagger climb. Because he does that in Origins as well. Yes. Against an ogre, I believe. Yes. That's <laughs> an old trick for Duncan at this point. Doesn't work there that well either. <laughs> well, not that time, unfortunately. Well, we'll get into that. But Duncan's made to feel really guilty because, you know, the rest of the group is right. Like, you're the one who took the risk. You should have died. And Genevieve's not really gonna fight them on that the only person the only people really feel bad for him are fiona and merrick Mm -hmm. and merrick basically says you did what you had to do you can't predict what other people are going to do and julian would have done the same thing regardless so here's my burden here's my guilt you're not the only one living with it and you become a better man after you deal with it is essentially his advice the second important part about merrick's story in here is his connection with fiona some of you may have theorized if you don't know the story, that Fiona is called to Merrick only to warm up to him later. Yes, the classic trope of quote-unquote resisting attraction is utilized in this book. Despite it being another elf, the attraction to Fiona for Merrick is more of a mutual respect. While Merrick starts a bit fascinated with her, he recognizes her dislike for him, or at least that Fiona just doesn't feel comfortable around him. Right. After she saves his life, healing him with her magic... He goes out of his way to let her know he would return the favor. Fiona's taken aback that a king would even be willing to say that out loud and assumes it's an empty promise. However, it is this exact promise that saves the group. In the taig they're traveling through to find Brigan, they encounter a demon that traps them all in dreams. Merrick wakes up to see himself married to Catriel as his queen with Rowan and Logan happily married elsewhere. Oh, that uh, that just brings back like, bad memories of origins. <laughs> right. So I, I don't want to get into it, but what's happening is is the place where magic comes from is called the Fade. It's also believed that's where dreams come from. One of the things that happens a lot in these stories is that demons or other magical-based creatures will trap you in these desire dreams mm-hmm. as a, as a, is, is essentially a way to put you in a prison that you don't want to escape. As much as the Catriel he wakes up next to tries to distract him, It is Merrick's promise to Fiona that causes him to be the first to fight off the fantasy that is hiding the metaphysical prison he finds himself in. 
After severing his ties to this dream, he helps almost the rest of the team resist their fantasies before finally saving Fiona. Her dream is not a fantasy, but actually a nightmare revealing that the life she knew before becoming a mage in the circle was one of hidden enslavement and torture. The Mm. demon taking the shape of a Count Dorian who had assaulted her in the real world as a young girl. With some teamwork, Merrick is able to give the killing blow to the demon, freeing everyone who wished to be freed, including Fiona. Did anybody wish to not be freed? Going back to Julian, who died because of the dragon, it wasn't really suggested super heavily in the earlier part of the book, but he's very close to, to another Grey Ward, Nicholas. When they find Nicholas in his fantasy... He's in the woods in a cabin with Julian, just living out the rest of their years before the the calling comes to them. Okay. And Nicholas literally tells the rest of the group, I promised Julian we were going to do this, and I'll never get a chance to do this again. You all can go, but I'm going to die here. Okay. And Um. it's so, and it, I don't know, I'm. It's like, yay, there was a there was a insinuation of a romantic gay couple there, but boo, they're both dead. Like right. it's just wasn't really what I was didn't matter to me that they were gay. It's cool, but And mm. it's kinda like I think because this is early on, like the way it's written, it's not explicit. Well, right. But you can but you could tell it's a deep love. So soon after defeating that demon, Merrick and Fiona find themselves unable to sleep. And Fiona thanks Merrick for saving her. Uh, After confirming it was Merrick's promise to Fiona that breaks the concentration, she cries and speaks of her dark past as a slave to the cruel Count Orlais, explaining, Slavery is illegal in the Empire, but it still goes on. Nobody pays attention if an elf disappears here or there. Oh, fun. Yeah. Yeah, and the extreme poverty... Yeah. Right. Merrick reassures her that he isn't that noble and even confesses his regret for killing Catriel and his burden of living for the good of Ferelden, which includes not only the murder of Catriel, but having to marry a woman who was in love with his best friend and then continuing to rule after his queen passed away. Right. Fiona asks, why is he telling her this? And he responds, everyone has nightmares, Fiona. This flood of honesty is then carnally indulged giving both of them a brief moment to forget all the pain that they're carrying and once again merrick beds an elf woman in the darkness of the deep roads it's a very particular fetish I'm he, uh, he has and it's a, not really the thing it's he not has really a thing it. he has a thing it's not really a thing it's a it's it's elven women fine and danger yes <laughs> Yes, a lot of it. Which is the weird part, honestly. Yeah. Because <laughs> the if I'm if correct me if I'm wrong, the deep roads are full of just like decay and stink and not where I would expect. Of it. Now parts of it. Now now when they're in this part of the Tig, it's not as overwhelming with darkspawn corruption, and there are parts that they find in the Tig that are not corrupted at all and in fact have like glowing lichen and are very beautiful and things like that. Mm. That's not where they end up actually making love. They end up actually That would make more sense. No, they they end up hooking up in the middle of these dwarven ruins away from the rest of the group. Mm. So, it's it's actually very sweet and genuine and and, and actually it, it, for Fiona, she realizes like this is a chance for me to have something that's from a like to be with a good man and have a good memory with a good man. And that's mm-hmm. how she sees it. And she's she's really the initiator. And Merrick's just kind of like, I like I want this, but only if you want this. And she's just taking off his armor, being like, What are you fighting this for? Let's just do it. <laughs> it's like <laughs> I would ne- I never picked up on that at all from her character in Inquisition, but it she's has been much, she's she's much older in Inquisition. I was gonna say it's been at least a few decades by that point. Thirty thirty years. Thirty years? Okay. It's about thirty years at that point. She doesn't look it, but no, she's an elf. She, she's an elf. <laughs> So they have a couple more moments and one more romantic encounter before the climax of the story. And then we have the epilogue months later. Duncan, now with a beard, and (laughs) Fiona come to see Merrick, who meets them at night because Logan is now convinced the Grey Wardens are trying to help Orlay take back Ferelden. Which, again, to Logan's credit, isn't unprecedented, but he's also hyper paranoid. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm trying to remember Fiona... I vaguely remember her having an Orlesian accent, correct? She is from Orlais. Okay. And that was, she was from an alienage in Orlais. She got 
sold by underground slavers and then sold to this guy, not thinking she was just going to have a comfy life and not realizing that she was going to be tortured. Right. His Do we ever see an alienage in Orlay itself? Not in Orlay. We only no. ha- we only have that really small little area in Orlay that we go to in the capital, and then everything else is like ruins and stuff, if I remember correctly. Right. Uh, you also see an alienage in Cork in Kirkwall in Dragon Age Two, and yes. you can where meet- Mero lives. And you can see a city, the city elf alienage in Denerim. Yes. You do see that in, in Origins. Yeah, I remember both of those. Okay. But, but yeah, but not in, not in Orlay. They're uh, rough. They're almost like slums. They are slums. They are slums. They, yeah. are, they are slums. They're very, they're very much, I mean, here's they call your, them, Here's your closet. I think they call them alienages because I think the writers wanted to be very sensitive and not call them ghettos. Right. Because they're very much of unfortunately that tradition of isolating a specific racial group from the rest of what's considered sophisticated civilization but it's basically like here's your lean to here's your shack here's your right if you have here's your hovel in the wall if you have a decent apartment quote unquote it is a closet right yeah and then the only thing that makes alienages unique in Dragon Age is that usually in the center of them, there's a big tree because that's kind of like for them, they have this tree that's the center of where everything happens because that ties them to some of what they believe are their old traditions of the old elves. Which are the Dalish. Which, well, which the Dalish Dalish know more of. The Dalish know more of. And in fact, if a Dalish elf, especially if it's a keeper, so the magical leader of any of the nomadic groups comes in immediately they nothing but respect from the city elves so they're meeting at night so that Logan doesn't really just interrupt everything because he's racist and thinks orlay is always trying to come back um, i mean is he entirely wrong at this point there's not really a lot of evidence to suggest orlay wants to come back okay so so it's basically he has his he just has his prejudices yeah he's ahab with his own moby dick that he mm-hmm. just can, constantly sees exactly Okay. But at this meeting, Fiona and Duncan present Fiona's infant son, who Merrick immediately recognizes as his child, for he even looks like his son, Kaylin. Fiona is unable to keep her child because of her oath to the Grey Wardens. Right. She's about to go to Weishaupt, actually, which is their main base that's way out in one of the western cities. Yeah, I see the look on your face. You probably know exactly what's going to be happening <laughs> next. Um, it just clicked who this is. <laughs> the boy presents as fully human. And noting this, Fiona wants Merrick's help in giving the son a better life, a human life without prejudice, and outside the fraught politics of being known as the bastard child of a king. Merrick, out of love for both of them, promises to fulfill these wishes. So some longtime fans, like Mystic, (laughs) will know who this son is. Alistair, the Grey Warden you meet along with Duncan at Ostagar at the beginning of the game. Well, beginning of Origins, I should say, specifically. Yeah. We'll talk more about Alistair soon, but yes, most half-elves present fully human, and Fiona explains this is partly why elves keep to themselves in the poverty spirit trick and alienages, and don't try to completely assimilate to human culture. So... Oh, because any... Right, because any, any half-elf presents as human anyway, so it's So like, it's almost like you're, you are you lose everything that makes you who you right. are if you have At these At least children. physically. Yeah, I mean, it's... You know, yeah, at least physically. It's not like when humans breed with other humans that don't look alike, usually it's a blend of the two. As an interracial child, I am a blend of the two. <laughs> right. So it with apparently That's weird that there's absolutely no like is there anything that is is from the his like physically elven? Nothing physical in almost all now in Dragon Age two there is a half there is a half elf that looks a little more elfy, has a little bit more of a pointed ear. Because of the way it's written, but that is a game that had a very rushed development. <laughs> so you're chalking it up to a de- rushed development, or is it just rare that they would present I with think mixed characteristics? I, I personally think, to be honest, the best way to say it is very rare. That okay, they almost always will present well, that's, human. That I'm sorry to say, that smacks of kind of cheap world building. I would say no. No? Okay. I would say no, merely because we shouldn't be expecting our world's genetics to work in a fantasy world's. Well, realm. It, yeah, fair. Okay, fine. Yeah. Merrick continues to rule Ferelden for another 15 years, eh, from what I can tell, rather uneventfully compared to his previous adventures. Then, about five years before the start of the Dragon Age Origins, 
Merrick was asked to help with some negotiations with the rulers of the many city-states and what's called the Free Marches. I mean, if you play Dragon Age 2, Kirkwall's one of the more powerful nations in the Free Marches. The it's at the very states. south end of it, though, too. Isn't yeah. It? Okay. And in, and in fact, he's sailing to Wycombe to help fulfill this obligation. But Wycombe, then, Wysop, these names are... <laughs> yeah. Spelled differently. But while sailing to Wycombe to fulfill this obligation, Merrick is lost at sea. Loghain searches for the king for about two years, apparently like on, like using a good chunk of the treasury, like willy-nilly, trying to find King Merrick. But then after... Does, the... does Loghain still consider himself a friend of Merrick? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, Even though he betrays him. Yeah, we'll get, we can get into that. But after this two-year search, Merrick is declared dead, and his son Caelan takes the throne and actually marries Loghain's daughter, Anora. This is the state of Ferelden you encounter when you start Dragon Age Origins. Despite his absence throughout the game, Merrick's influence is solidly felt. As the Warden, the character you play in Origins, is trying to help reestablish centuries-old alliances in order to fight the Fifth Blight that Merrick was warned would come, the politics of Ferelden make your task almost impossible from the beginning. Mm -hmm. After the Warden is recruited by the older, wiser Duncan, they're taken to the old fort of Ostagar. The two meet King Caelan upon their arrival, who seems very confident of a victory like stories he'd heard in the past. Duncan is unconvinced. Meanwhile, if the Warden is able to speak with Logan before the night of battle, Logan complains that Kaelin seems to be chasing glory, and that Merrick would not be so foolish. Having read the books now, knowing how Merrick's personality was during his youth, full of hope and humor and dedication, Kaelin seems to be acting just like his dad. That's just <laughs> how I that's how I see it. When you see King Kaelin and Logan meeting about the battle plans right before the moment, basically that night of the Battle of Ostagar, you meet them so you see what you what your task is gonna be. They're kind of arguing. They're right. they're arguing about whether Kalen should be on the front lines with the Grey Wardens or using the royal forces at all at this point. Right. Kalen tells Logan to quote, remember who is your king, and suggests that if Logan is so uncertain that they can wait to allow the Orlesian forces to come help them with the battle. This angers Logan further, and he again says Merrick would be ashamed of such a prospect of inviting their former occupiers as allies. With tensions in the air, they mention the strategy to have the Warden and Alistair light a signaling beacon during the battle. The most honest, uh, honestly, one of my least favorite parts of that whole game. Was that, was the beacon? Yeah, the tutorial mission is just kind of boring. Well, it... <laughs> and you have to... It's one of those ones you have to play through the same way. There's no differentiation to it. There's no choice to make. It's just fight to the top and light the beacon. That's... But to be honest, it's... But that's not here. That's neither here nor there. So, yeah, sorry. I, yeah. No, I wouldn't... I'm not worried about it. Those of you who know the game know this is where Logan portrays the Grey Wards in King Kalen, and thus the greatest betrayal that Flemeth foretold. As I say, this is like the last big betrayal. Mm -hmm. Merrick knew the Blight was coming and trusted the Grey Wardens to be dedicated to vanquishing it. In fact, specifically Duncan, with the issues that they dealt with, he knew Duncan was dedicated to the cause because of everything they lost while going through the deep roads and, and knowing that Duncan was the one that was coming back at the time, second in command of the Grey Wardens in Ferelden at the, at the end of The Calling. That, that story. Do you think Duncan knows that he was betrayed? No, Dun I don't think they ever tell the Grey Wardens about the promise with the, the Witch in the Wilds. That's something that Merrick kind of keeps to himself in the back of his head. Well, no, I mean, I, mem I vaguely remember, and you've probably seen this more recently than I have, mm -hmm. but I vaguely remember during that fight, after he has climbed on an ogre with two swords... Yes, repeating his old trick, like yeah, we mentioned. He looks up and sees the beacon lit, but doesn't see the reinforcements coming. I think, I think at that moment... Do you think moment, it clicks for him that... I think it clicks for him. Okay. I think it clicks for him that, once again, politics are getting in the way. And that's exactly kind of what happens near the end of The Calling as well, which, again, I won't get into that. <laughs> But <laughs> okay. it's it's kind of, for him. I'm sure it's just like not again. And this is how I'm gonna die. This is awful. We never get his body back, do we? There is a, a DLC called Return to Ostagar where you can find you get Kalen's body. You can find where Duncan. You could find Duncan's body, I believe. Okay. So I remember you find Kalen's body like crucified or essentially something oh, yeah. like that. It's yeah. symbolic. Yeah. When Logan ignores the order to charge from the beacon that the Warden lights and withdraws the Ferelden troops that let the majority of the Ferelden Wardens die along with Kaelin, he ignores all the worries 
that at one time or another consumed Merrick. Merrick knew that a blight would come. Merrick knew the Grey Wardens could stop it. Merrick knew that Duncan as a leader could be trusted to uphold a duty and oath to the Wardens. Loghain decides that his fear of losing everything Merrick and him fought for during the Orlesian occupation is better to be avoided. His pride and his fear are the source of his betrayal, at least in my opinion. He lets Merrick's heir die, as well as Merrick's good friend, who helped protect and train the bastard son Merrick could never raise himself. So that is, I think, the biggest and final betrayal right. that Loghain does to Merrick that Flemeth foretold. I'm trying to remember now what Loghain's plan was for the Blight then. He didn't have a plan for the Blight. So he had no plan. He was just he, that scared of... He didn't of think or- it was a Blight. I mean, you see Darkspawn coming to the surface. That's... At that point, they hadn't seen an archdemon. And you can have like random roving darkspawn okay. with that in between blights without there being an archdemon. So they're not even sure that when, it's a blight. When does he actually realize it's a blight? I'll be honest, just thinking back to what I know of the Origins game, and I'll, and I'll let fans tweet at me if they think otherwise, I don't think he realizes it's a blight. I think he's so blindly focused on making sure Ferelden stays independent and that everything runs the way that he thinks it should. I don't even think it's necessarily he's power hungry. I just think he's an isolationist to a fault. Right, but I know in Origins that you can recruit him as a warden. I think that's that's the only time he would actually be able to admit that he was possibly wrong. Okay. But I never play it like that. We'll get into those <laughs> options later. <laughs> I mean, we're gonna are we going through the whole game here or no? Not all parts of the game, but okay. we're gonna go through the we'll cover Dragon the Merrick, Origins itself. We're gonna be going through the Merrick related stuff with the game, which includes a lot of Loghain, to be perfectly honest. In fact, throughout the game, as the Warden and Alistair chase down Grey Warden contracts and forge alliances with diverse groups of people, Loghain essentially starts a civil war with Ferelden nobles, even using Rowan's name to undermine the honor of her surviving brother, Tegan. Tegan speaks out against Loghain's self-appointment as Anora's regent, so Queen Anora's regent, which happens to be his daughter. How convenient is that? Hmm. And Tegan criticizes Loghain's withdrawal during the Battle of Ostagar. I wondered if this conflict was more fraught because Tegan knows about what his older brother, Eamon, did for Merrick. Eamon Garen raised Alistair in his home, away from the politics of the castle, and as a human, just as Fiona requested. Alistair knew he was the bastard's son and in fact thought he was a full human and the product of a pithy dalliance between a king and a servant girl. You can even chase down his alleged older sister, Goldana, in Denerim, who resents Alistair because her mother died after birth and essentially she was been stuck as a pauper ever since and you see her like poor with children and she basically right. like, if you don't give me money then what's what use are you to me, Alistair? And it breaks Alistair's heart because he was hoping for this orphan reunion of like yes i'm your lost brother and and she is just not into it but the, he's not yeah but i think that cover story is well maintained thanks to a faulty memory because she's a she's a little girl right when her mother dies and she thinks they stole this baby and she thinks that alistair's it and knowing how faulty memory can be right she might have thought that that was it and she, or maybe she hears Alistair comes and she goes, oh, you're the reason why my mom died? You know, right. forget you. It's either faulty memory or it's intentionally obscured mm-hmm. memory. But the Garens know that they have raised, as of now, the last remaining bloodline of Merrick. And for that, King Callan had. There is a lands meet in Ferelden before they find the confrontation of the old god that must be destroyed. So a lands meet, of course, the nobles meet together and they're going to make some decisions. This lands meets for all the nobles' houses to finally solidify who's ruling Ferelden. Should it be Queen Anora, who married into the Theron family and has shown some political prowess even during Caelan's rule? Or should it be Grey Warden Alistair, who was the last surviving member of the original bloodline of Callanhad? despite his inexperience and reluctance to the position. The warden commander gets to decide after besting Loghain in a duel or selecting a companion to do it for them, as long as it's not the dog. 
Really? You can select somebody else to do it. You can select somebody else to do it. You can select somebody else to be your hero. And in fact, there's a great line where he you can select your dog and literally Arl Eamon goes, uh, no, Warden, I'm afraid we're not going to. It's just such a ridiculous choice. Well, if I'm going to select anybody, it's going to be Shale. Oh, I know. <laughs> if Shale's available, why not? Uh, you can choose either Nora as queen, Alistair as king, or potentially decide the two should be married. And then depending on your background as the warden, you can even marry one or the other to rule with them. But sorry, only heterosexual coupling for that option. Because again, having an heir is an important task in this world. That actually makes sense. Yeah. They're very, it's, it's hyper-focused on having an heir. Well... <laughs> Yeah. Eurocentric fantasy. <laughs> yes, exactly. It is very possible that if Merrick had not been lost on his way to Wycombe, none of the events of Dragon Age Origins would have happened. It's true. Loghain would have respected the decisions of the king he fought beside in the past, even if they were the same decisions that Kaelin made. It's possible that if Loghain had turned on Merrick, that Kaelin would have survived and fulfilled his father's wishes in spite of Loghain's pursuit to keep Ferelden independent without any supposed interference from the Grey Wardens or Orlesian allyship. It would have been a completely different tale either way. This is why I wanted to touch upon Merrick's influence, because it is felt so deeply in the world of Thetis during all the games, even though he is absent. In fact, it right. is so important because he is absent mysteriously so yeah so where is merrick this is when we get we'll to find th out in dragon age 4 no 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 actually well we're gonna find <laughs> out now we get to the comic book of the series the first one we'll dive into is the silent grove for these series bioware had to make its own canon for the stories and in this canon alistair is now king of ferelden oh so they said okay so they have a, can a canon for here's all the choices you could make but here's our canon one Here's the canon choices, okay. yeah. And there's and at least in the omnibus that you gave me, there's no suggestion of a Queen Honora, so it's just King Alistair. Now, through his former travel huh. companion of Zevran, so which is another companion that can travel with... Zesty Zevran? Zesty Zevran, who can travel with the Warden in Origins, he hears a rumor that his father Merrick had been seen in a prison managed by the Assassin's Group, the Antivan Crows. Which huh. Antiva is another country that's north of Ferelden, and the Antivan Crows are essentially their very well-known group of assassins. Very well-known because of the work that they leave behind, not because you know who the assassins are. <laughs> so. Right. Uh, Antiva is northeast of Ferelden, kind yeah, of, right? Yeah, I, th I think so. It's east of the Free Marches, I believe? Yeah, I believe so. Okay. I don't remember it off the top of my head, unfortunately. With the help of Isabella and Varric, two beloved companions of Hawk from the second Dragon Age game, he breaks in and frees the man that was Merrick's cellmate. Apparently, Merrick had been questioned for years by the crows and kept locked up there with this man. However, a witch of the wild shows up more than four years into Merrick's imprisonment and demands he is to be released. Without hesitation, the crows hand Merrick over. A... Witch of the Wilds. This witch is not Flemeth, but her daughter, Yavanna, who inhabits the Talari swamps near Antiva. Okay. You don't right. know about Yavanna unless you read this comic, to be no, perfectly honest. No, I get that. I forgot that Flemeth had daughters. She has more than one. Right. I yeah. forgot about more than Morgan. So. Right. And Yavanna, as you read the comic, like Morgan's like got this horrible relationship with her mother, which feels like almost abusive and like she's been manipulated and Yavanna's basically like that girl threw away a gift she does not understand huh okay so the former cellmate says that Merrick had left a message for his son quote he said he had to do it he said he was sorry Alistair Isabella and Varric do end up finding Yavanna in what is called the silent grove da 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 the title's back hmm. protected by a dragon she reveals to oh boy. Yeah. She reveals to Alistair that Merrick has promised to submit himself to Yavanna once his heir was a fully grown adult in order to have his life saved from the Kakari Wilds all those years ago. She says he lived with purpose and that is that she will reveal no more. Soon after, the traveling three are ambushed by some Antivan crows who capture Alistair. Varric barters with Yavanna for aid going back to where she is, and she heals him and Isabella and tells them to find their friend and, quote, do your part. So then they kill the captors of Alistair, including their leader, Merchant Prince Claudio. Yvonne briefly revives Claudio's corpse in the middle of the swamp and basically says, your flesh is going to be eaten by maggots. Would you like your soul to be eaten by maggots too? Answer my question. Who's your master? And that's when he reveals 
that he's working for Aurelian Titus, who is a Tevinter magister, which is basically like noble mages in mm-hmm. Tevinter. Yvonne then reveals to Alistair that Merrick's blood, as well as his own, is powerful enough to awaken sleeping dragons. Dragons had previously been hunted to extinction. At least that is what was assumed until the dragons appeared along the Elysian countryside during their occupation of Ferelden, right after Merrick had made his deal with Flemeth. Yvonne says the blood of Kalanhad is so great it can awaken even the greatest of dragons who had been hiding in the Silent Grove, sleeping and waiting for a chance to roam the world again. Yvonne finds this a noble cause, stating, quote, The blood of the dragons is the blood of the world. And when Alistair and Varric and Isabella are like, they're monsters, Yavanna affirms that they do not understand how the world works at all. And of course they would think that way because they're ignorant. Hmm. She actually invites Alistair to help finish what Merrick had started and free his father from his oath to awaken the last of the great dragons with his blood because he's also got the blood of Kalanhad in him. Right. Alistair responds by running Yavanna through with his sword killing her. Oh, that's familiar. Or so we think. I'm not convinced when any Witch of the Wilds is supposedly murdered. It's true. Alistair still wants to track down his father. Isabella and Varric continue to help him. Trying to take Aurelian Titus down into Venter doesn't work. And through a very fraught capture and negotiation, Alistair reunites with the air shock of the Canari, who he formerly knew as Sten, another companion from Origins. So he's air shock now. He's essentially, after the air shock in Dragon Age 2, went to Kirkwall and totally just acted dumb. They promoted the Sten that we met, which Sten was his title. Now he's air shock. Now he's air shock. So that, and because again, name is what your purpose is. So he doesn't have a permanent name. He has a title as what he's called. And he is now the air shock. But he knows. Alistair. Okay. So that's how Alistair's like, oh, okay. Yeah. Because I remember reading that Sten looked the way he did because of his rank, which doesn't sound quite right. From what I remember when I read The World of Thetis, he looks like that because certain Canari who are born that look the way he does without the horns are fated for some sort of greatness. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's a fate thing. Destiny. Fantasy. Yes, exactly. <laughs> With the help of the Kunari fleets, Alistair infiltrates Aurelian's base with Isabella and Varric in the comic Until We Sleep. There, Varric finds a man, presumably Merrick, hooked up to a large magical contraption that is utilizing his blood for power. It looks awful. Basically, Merrick is stripped down with only like a loincloth, and he has these glass tubes connecting to this huge orb and he's strapped like upside down and you could tell that his blood is essentially circulating through this weird magical contraption it is awful sounds grotesque instinctually Varric shoots the center of this contraption hoping to put Merrick out of his misery instead Varric is pulled into a fantasy where his former love Bianca is by his side now some of you are like Bianca isn't that his crossbow no that actually is the name of somebody that Varric is in love with. (laughs) So it just happens. And that is the woman who made his crossbow. So that's why he named it Bianca. Mm. So knowing this is a fantasy because the relationship did not work out before, he recognizes this to be the same kind of magical dream trap that I referenced before, a trap Merrick broke when he was imprisoned by the demon in the old Tig. With the same determination and strategy, Varric goes to free his allies, including a mage named Mayveris, who explains the contraption Varric is is connected to. I mean, the, the contraption that Merrick, that Merrick is, connected is connected to that Varric saw. It is called a Magrellan. And I might be pronouncing that wrong because, of course, this isn't a comic book. I just hear MacGuffin. <laughs> it's Magrellan, M-A-G-R-A-L-L-E-N. It could okay. be like a Madrellan as well, but I think it's Magrellan. Well, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. I mispronounce, I mispronounce stuff all the time. Right. A contraption that is used to enter dreams at will and control people's minds. It seems that Merrick's blood is strong enough to power that w- the one Aurelian built. And when Varric tried to destroy it, it probably engulfed everybody on that base into these fantasy dreams. <laughs> and that's how much power it's holding. Varric is able to help also free Isabella, Alistair, and even Merrick from the illusion of the dream. But they still have to fight Aurelian in his own fantasy in the same dream. 
Realizing he's the only one sustaining the dream, Merrick is able to help ambush Aurelian and slay him, giving everyone a chance to wake up. Before they do, Merrick confirms to Alistair that this was not the life that he nor his mother wanted for him, but he's happy to know Ferelden is in good hands. Knowing this may be his last words, he's willing to accept his death, even as Alistair convinces him to try and live again if he can. At that moment, everyone awakens from the dream, and all can see how far gone Merrick truly is. He's wasted away. There is no going back. Maveris, Maveris, I should say, confirms that there is little hope in actually reviving Merrick for good. It's right. all theoretical mage studies at this point. Alistair decides to break Merrick's connection to the Magrellan, which shatters not only the contraption, but Merrick's body like glass. With that, the life of Merrick is officially over. Keep in mind, this is in what is called the, quote, Bioware canon, meaning that this may not follow the story that many players have heard. If Alistair is not king of Ferelden, we do not know what this means for Merrick. Does that mean that through the series and into the awaited fourth installment of the Dragon Age that Merrick could still be hooked up to the Magrellan? Is it possible the Canari who were on Aurelian's tail before Alistair was pursuing him would find Merrick instead? I'm hoping these questions will be answered. One last thing about Merrick. His legacy continues to be an issue. When King Caelan and Queen Honora wed, it was later on rumored that Honora was infertile. In the Return to Ostagar DLC for Origins, a letter from Arl Eamon worries about how Honora is approaching 30 and they have yet to produce an heir to the throne. Eamon urges to King Caelan, I submit to you again that it might be time to put Honora aside. We parted harshly the last time I spoke of this, but it has been a full year since then, and nothing has changed. Again, there's this obsession of an heir. With Kaelin's demise, the only other opportunity for a blood heir is Alistair. There's some complications with this. Even if he marries Anora, who is rumored to be infertile, but we know that could go both ways, so for all we know, King Kaelin is the one who's infertile. So I, to me, it could be Kaelin or Anora. We don't know. And now it could be Alistair or Anora. But... And now it could be Alistair. And Grey Wardens very rarely conceive children. It is believed that the ability is hindered due to their connection to the Darkspawn taint. And in fact, Alistair existing is a pure miracle at all. It's very rare that Grey Wardens have children. And that's why the policy is if a Grey Warden has a kid, they don't have a, they don't have a lineage thing. Right. It, they, very, they give up the kid. They're like, okay, you weren't supposed to exist. Go somewhere else. You're an, practically an impossibility. There is one more possibility, however. In Dragon Age Origins, one of your companions is a daughter of Flemeth named Morrigan, who we've kind of referenced before. Mm -hmm. Before the battle against the Archdemon with your allies that you acquired in place, it is revealed that the only way to defeat an Archdemon is for a Grey Warden to give the killing blow, which prevents the soul of an Archdemon from possessing a nearby Darkspawn and continuing with its campaign against Thetis. This kills the Grey Warden in the process, but that Grey Warden is remembered as a great hero. Right. Knowing this, the Warden, the main character of the game, has to prepare to die until Morrigan gives him an out. Or her an out. Gives them an out, I should say. She can perform a quote-unquote dark ritual, which will attract the soul of the Archdemon, which we have to remember also is an old god <laughs> that was worshipped centuries ago, into her womb and allow her to give birth to the god as a child. That's not problematic at all. As the warden, you can convince Alistair to partake in this dark ritual and provide the seed that Morrigan needs for this to work. Yes, this means he sleeps with Morrigan. This guarantees a child. Guarantees. Like, absolutely, it's going to happen. So it's probably a Nora, then. What do you mean? Infertile. Well, no, I think it's because it's a ritual. Oh, you think that supersedes... Every okay. I think it supersedes any kind of infertility because if you're a male warden, you can also do this with Mor Morrigan. And if you do what you you reminded us is an option before, if you spare Loghain's life, and that means Alistair leaves forever because he's just he's just so betrayed by the right. idea of Loghain even existing, Loghain can also do this ritual as well. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> nobody nobody wants to think about that. P.S. If he comes back in Inquisition, he looks a lot more handsome <laughs> been there than he did in Origins. Just going to say that. Not that it makes it better. But this means Alistair can sleep with Morrigan and guarantees a child. So in the third game, Dragon Age Inquisition, you're introduced to this child by Morrigan as her son, 
Kieran. Kieran with the old god soul in him, his estranged child. But by the end of the game, he won't carry that soul of the old god with him anymore. Something I don't want to spoil. Let the fantastic voice acting of Claudia Black and Kate Mulgrew carry the scene for you. Like, they do such a good job of making it so personal. So, I don't want to spoil that. But this means that the last remaining line of Merrick, the last remaining line of Callanhad even, may be the grandson of the Witch of the Wilds. Because everything is circular in this universe. Otherwise, Merrick's lineage may be permanently over. It's possible that both Kaelin and Alistair are dead at the end of Origins, depending on the player's choices. And Alistair definitely died a virgin, if so. Mm. Or either a virgin or not bearing any children. Yeah. Yeah. Kaelin has some dalliances that are alluded to, but by the time of Dragon Age Inquisition, 10 years after his death, there are no claims to any bastard children from him. And with all these possibilities of heir apparent issues, I can't see Ferelden being stable for long. Again, had Merrick not been absent, this may not have been an issue. This could have been rectified. Right. But a lot of opportunities have been lost. Again, I submit that King Merrick Theron is one of the most influential characters in the entire Dragon Age series, despite his absence from all three related games. In fact, it's entirely because of his absence that Thetis is still on very shaky ground politically, making whatever future adventures we find in the upcoming Dragon Age 4 even more fraught. And I think we might not have our next adventures in Ferelden, but that's going to be something that has to be resolved. Ferelden is almost... At this point, because of they're the center of where the last blight was, they they cannot be ignored. So that's that's my episode. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> this was a long one. Yeah, I didn't I didn't expect it to be long. Well, you had a lot to be able to add to it because you've played the games and everything. Right. Any questions, Mystic? No, I have to feel I have to parse all of this still. You're still processing. You basically threw a lot at me that I didn't know. Right. This is a lot, I think, that... You know, there's a lot of fans like me who like to dive deep into this stuff. And... Oh, the Dragon Age fans are probably more into lore than the Mass Effect fans are. And they're both right. very lore-heavy franchises. Yeah. And there are a lot of us. But I would say most people who've played Dragon Age and like Dragon Age haven't even thought about this. Like, haven't right. even thought about how this one person, even if you don't know the books, just the idea that King Merrick is not there, you have to understand, affects so much of everything you do in the in these three games. And right. probably even though it's suggested that Dragon Age 4 is going to be more kind of like in the Tevinter area, a country that we've met people from but haven't really messed with yet, that, I mean, we're still going to have this issue of, you know... By the time Dragon Age Inquisition is happening, Anora is almost 40. Yeah. And so if she is still part of the ruling class, there's there's this idea that she will never bear a child. Alistair, if he hasn't done the ritual, how is he going to bear a child? Either he's trying to bear it with Anora, and he's a Grey Warden, so they he already has an issue. Or it's a Grey Warden trying to have a child with another Grey Warden. Right. Which is... Yeah. You know, sounds mostly like the line is dead then, unless Kieran is involved. Unless Kieran is involved, and and it's kind of sad because it's a. I mean, obviously the blood of King Callanhad is considered very strong. Um, in the comic in between the two that I referenced, it suggests the Canari have a theory that King Callanhad drank dragon blood in order to become powerful enough to unite Ferelden, and that's why their bloodline is so strong. I love how both. But it's a Canari I, I, theory. I, I love how both uh, Dragon Age and Elder Scrolls both deal with the ruling family having dragon blood. Right. In some form. Right. Dragons are always a fascination with these series. But again, that's also a theory. I'm and One of the things that Dragon Age does really well is that there's a lot of theories of stuff, but nothing's really proven. Mm. Well, I think this has been a long enough episode. Yeah. If you guys want to get in contact with us, you can reach us at loretogether at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. And if you want to contact us on Twitter, where Safi handles most of that, that'll yep. be at loretogether. If you want to find me on Reddit, because I post in each of the games communities where we do stuff, so I'll be in the Dragon Age community soon, you can find me at the username loretogetherpod. And then if you want to support us on Patreon, yes. you can head over to patreon.com slash loretogether. 
That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com. And there you can have a per episode pledge. You can get episodes early. You can Mm -hmm. join us for our streams. And soon you'll get access to mini episodes very early compared to the public. And I think for the stream, now that Mystic knows things a little bit better, I think either we want to do a save where we're doing the Battle of Ostagar or we're doing Red Cliff. Because Redcliffe is yeah. where the Garens are. And it's interesting to see where the Garens are after Rowan is now been gone for some time and Kaylin, her we only could, child, we is could keep dead. It, we could keep it very RPG. Mm-hmm. I will roll for the origin and stuff. Mm. And then they can pick whether we do Ostagar or Redcliffe. Okay. And I'll play through one of those. But for the origin, there's so many origins because you have male, female, you have three different three different races. Three different races. And then you have each race has at least two origins. Right. So, so that's yeah. just that's a quite a poll. So I'll roll for the origin. Mm-hmm. They probably have a randomizer already on the internet for it for mm-hmm. you too. So but yeah, I think it's it'll be fair then that we have Mystic do the the live stream. Yay, I get to live stream. You get to be on the computer. I'm fine with being on the computer. (laughs) All right, guys, we're going to end it here. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much. It'll be some time before I get back to Dragon Age because this was a lot. (laughs) Bye, guys. Bye. Love you. Bye. 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 Bye.